So I was just jamming a little bit with my loop pedal on the jazz blues. So today we're going to take a look at the jazz blues. I'm assuming that most people that follow my channel, you know what a jazz blues is. But hopefully I can give you some new ideas on how to practice, how to get better uh, at, at playing the jazz blues. I'm also going to talk about a few, what I consider mistakes that we make, both as teachers as, and as students when we're trying to tackle the jazz blues. So lots of stuff to cover um just let's just get right into it so again i think most of you know what a jazz blues is but just to make sure that there's no confusion i'm just gonna go over it so we're gonna take a look at a blues in b flat so first off let's play a regular blues in b flat like this to F here, the 5 chord, down to E flat, right? This is just a blues. And of course, we have to separate the terms. When we talk about blues, we're talking about a form, 12 bar blues. It doesn't have to be 12 bars, but the most common is 12 bars. Could be minor, could be major, all these variations that we're gonna talk about. And then it's also a genre. And this is not that, we, we're approaching it from a jazz perspective. We're not trying to play blues like John Lee Hooker or something like that. And then it's also a feeling, right? You're feeling blue. What are we doing when we're playing a jazz blues? I think Charlie Parker and those guys, what they did, they started adding chords. So a two five here to the E flat, to the four chord. So F minor. common. Instead of F, we're playing C minor. F. And then a turn around. So instead of going f 5 to 4, we're playing 2, 5, 1, right? A lot of times you will hear this even in real blues or regular blues, they will play those chords there too, in, in more modern types of blues, I guess. So it's not unique for jazz. That two chord could also be a dominant. So C7 to F. Then you get that the third of that chord the blue note, or not the blue note, but the, the flat five of the blues game. I'm gonna talk about scales and arpeggios over these chords and licks and all that good stuff that I know some of you are waiting for, but a couple of things we need to make sure that we can do before we get to that. First off, we need to be able to calm. So I'm playing a walking bass in guy, guy tones. Sometimes I'm just staying on the same bass note. So there's nothing fancy. I'm not doing anything fancy. If you want to don't know anything about how to play walking bass, uh, this book is great for that. The Jazz Theory Resources by Bert Ligon. I've covered that book before. You don't have to get super advanced with the walking, like Joe Pass, Martin Taylor, Howard Roberts. They can play melodies at the same time and they can play a chord on every beat. I can't do that. I could figure it out. But for me, that's more 
if you're playing like a solo concert or you're playing solo guitar. If I'm playing with just another guitar player, I, I'm just doing this like... So sometimes I'm playing the bass lines and sometimes I'm just... The important thing is that it's swinging. Then we need to learn a bunch of melodies because that's another mistake that we make. You go to your teacher and ask, how do I play over a jazz blues? Well, it's this scale over that chord and this scale over that chord, but there's no melody. Same thing is as if you were learning a standard. Before you get to all the scales and arpeggios and all the substitutions and all this stuff, do you know the melody? Because I guess, I imagine that's how it all started, right? Those players were playing the melody and then they started embellishing more and more and eventually you had jazz improvisation. Not sure that that's what happened, but I imagine that's kind of how it all, it all evolved. So here's another mistake that a lot of students as well as teachers make in the beginning is they, they try to learn all the Charlie Parker heads, the tricky ones. And uh, what is it? pretty tricky and don't get me wrong here I'm not saying you should learn those you should definitely learn all those the Billy Billy's bounce and the tenor madness and all those but there are easier blues heads let's call them blues melodies that you could learn before you learn those tricky Charlie Parker heads so I'm just gonna play a few of those right now I'm gonna start with the famous C jam blues even though we're playing in B flat but that's okay <laughs> few pretty easy kind of shout chorus type melodies they're almost like riffs before smoke on the water that was you know loose in the closet oh shit i forgot one of the most important ones Should definitely listen to Grant Green's version of that. Actually, you could stop this video and not watch any of it. Instead, go and listen to S Grant Green playing Sunny Moon for two and learn that solo, and that should probably be uh, a better lesson. So, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? For many reasons. So, obviously, I'm just playing in one kind of feel right now. There could be Different feels doesn't have to be swing, me, what is it, medium swing? Could be more of a like a boogaloo kind of feel, it could be a, more of a Latin. You have this tune, for example.
Latin kind of clave feel to it. That's uh, Chitlins con Carne by Kenny Burrell. Fantastic beginner jazz blues tune. It's a regular blues, right? And But he's playing the pentatonic, he's playing blues scale. He does, he's not playing anything, but it sounds like jazz. So that's a great beginner solo actually for for those of you who are kind of getting, are new to this stuff. Then these heads kind of suggest a certain feel, right? <laughs> swing if you can't make it swing at all then forget the scales and the arpeggios right you know what i mean like this is more important so if you don't know how to swing uh, you have to figure out how to do that it's very hard to teach that but i strongly recommend playing along with recordings it's not the same as playing with real people live and you know but at least you're getting a feel for the right feel and uh, for example this tune Splanky right then there's the shout chorus different feel than it's not just a tempo it's they all have a different character to them so if you're jamming with somebody don't just play a blues play a famous melody right oh by the way the that tune Splanky the Count Basie I can't remember the name of the solo Frank Foster is that his name please let me know in the comments those of you who know this stuff better than I do the first solo he plays there, everything you need to know about how to play over a jazz blues is in that solo. You transcribe it, play along with it. It's perfect. It shows that time feels relaxed and it's swinging. Another thing you notice perhaps that I'm doing when I'm playing these melodies, some of them, uh, is that I'm playing the chords. to play chord stabs in your solo it's really nice to do and so th these melodies riffs kind of suggest where to do that so you can use these as quotes when you're playing standards and practice that stuff it also makes you understand how the kind of tones relate to the chords right so minor and then I have to play the D flat because there's that chord aha uh -huh. and then that works over the G because that's the flat you know so it makes you aware of the notes you're landing on what how they relate to the chords and some of you might be thinking well is it major Shouldn't we be playing mixolydian over a dominant chord? So it's not really a major scale, it's just like a chromatic leading tone or a surround tone. But you could actually play major over a blues, like Django Reinhardt kind of does that sometimes. So these blues heads work also over jazz blues as well as a regular blues set of changes. Some of the recordings, if you listen to, I suggest go to Spotify or whatever streaming service you're using and make a playlist of these tunes and listen to them. And you sometimes there is a regular blues changes and sometimes both. Okay, so 
learn a few melodies, make it swing. You should also do this in different keys. Some people get obsessed with the learning in all 12 keys. If you can do that, if you're a more advanced player, then maybe you should work on that. It's a really good thing to be able to do that. If I ask you, like, do you know this melody, whatever a standard, and you say yes, and I ask you, well, play it in another key and you can't do it, then you, you're not really that strong. You don't know that. If you know a melody, you should be able to play it in any key. But don't get stuck in the whole idea of have to play everything in every all 12 keys because there are only that many hours in a day. So it's good to go through that kind of practice uh, routine sometime where you do that, but don't get obsessed with it, but definitely learn these heads in B flat and F. Those are most common jazz blues keys because of horn players. They prefer those keys. But as guitar players, we should also C, obviously, G is a good one. And E flat, a lot of the earlier Count Basie recordings, they play in D flat for some reason. I guess it has to do with the horns. It sounds good for that key. I'm, I'm not sure why. So you've done that. You know a few heads, you make it swing, and you know how to comp. Now let's talk about scales and arpeggios and licks. All the good stuff. So let's go back to a regular blues. Well, what you can do is just play mixolydian, right? play along with me. So we just mix a little bit. One more time. You can play along with me. Combine that with blue stuff. Perhaps. That's the scales over regular blues. Try to combine it with blues. Major, major blues scale. And the blues scale. And all this kind of stuff. You know, so it's like combinations of mixolydian, chromatics, and, uh, and the blues scale. That's another head riff I forgot to mention. Is it called Burke's Works or something like that? I actually don't know it, but that's a melody I quote it all the time. All these tunes, all these melodies are great to quote, especially this one. I hear people quote that all the time. So you combine the scales with stuff that you know, like licks that you have, loose licks, and the melodies. If you can tie it all together, that's great. But now let's go to the jazz blues. So here's a, not the next mistake we make, or the teachers make, I think. They assign a scale to each every chord. So B flat 7, then F minor 7, oh there's F Dorian, and then perhaps altered, and then the E flat 7, the uh, mixolydian scale there and then this E diminished nobody knows what the hell you're supposed to play there it's like well let's just ignore that then B flat 7 and then G altered with the G7 uh, not sure about that I mean obviously you can do that and you should do that but is it the first choice of scales mm. Dorian F7 so we're gonna simplify it because you don't have to play all those scales so play it mixolydian for B flat E flat then do this because the B flat mixolydian is the same as F Dorian so we don't have to 
we have we don't have to think about the F Dorian. It's still the same. Then we do this. So the scale that we're looking for there is some kind of E flat mixolydian with an E. Maybe instead of the F or instead of the E flat or. If I play like that, that's actually a F harmonic minor, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking Mixolydian just changed the one note. And I'll do the same here. So the B is the third of the G7. And then I ignore the C minor, just think F7 over the whole thing. I got this, this is a Barry Harris thing, so I got this from the YouTube channel that I always refer to, which is things I learned from Barry Harris. I've talked about that before, I'll link to that, so I'm shamelessly stealing that from his stuff. So I'll play this for you. fingers and then you try to combine it with stuff you already know like maybe you have a few two five licks over the over the C minor to F should also mention that what a lot of Bach players do is when you play the E flat E diminished that B flat seven they treat it like a major seven or a D minor so you will hear this kind of stuff. So that's a very Charlie Parker thing to do. Then of course you can play the fourth bar as an altar. But that's another of those mistakes I think a lot of people make. They That's what happened to me and I was trying to learn this stuff. I wanted to know how to play. I didn't like my own solos when I tried to play over jazz blues. And I, so I went to teachers and they gave me all these kind of reharms and you know you can do this here, you play this chord here and all these tricky substitutions and even like Coltrane cycles or whatever. And that's not what I was looking for. I wanted to make it simpler. So that's why I think this is excellent. Because then you can, if you can do that, and you just add diminished arpeggio and bop stuff, right? So, but I'm not thinking about different scales for every chord, if that makes sense. I'm thinking because the B flat mixo, and the dominant scale you would play over this, it's pretty much the same scale. It's just a B natural instead of B flat, right? So B flat dot mixo. Sorry. And the dominant scale you play over the G. Right, so what is it? It's a C melodic minor, sorry, C harmonic minor. But again, I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking, instead of thinking next chord, seven new notes, it's just changing one note. That's uh, it's more simple. Also, one thing they often do, I should mention, is when they, after the diminished, play this. Right, so uh, B flat, E flat, D minor. So. on 
on here with bob scales we're gonna start start on the root and d7 so a bob scale is just adding a major seven to the scale so then i get chord tone passing tone chord tone passing tone chord tone passing tone Ignoring, so it's not that I'm actually ignoring the F minor 7, I'm just not considering it the Dorian scale because it's the same thing. Then E flat dot Bob scale. You have to find a good fingering. I'd like to slide the index there. Okay, and uh, there I'm actually ignoring the diminished chord because it's pretty much the same. Mixolydian flat two, flat six, bob scale. If you have no idea what bob scales are, I have made videos about that before, and there's there are many resources on YouTube. And and then F seven again. I'm not thinking about the C minor. Let's see if I can do this. practice before I make these videos that was a little bit faster than I intended so even if you think that or I think that oh I know my bob scales always need to practice it it's also very good for articulation and that's why I'm not telling you what fingers to use you have to figure it out yourself I think to make it sound like jazz right like how you so it that's uh I can't cover that in this video because there's too much to talk about and the video will go on forever. So I'm kind of assuming that you know how to swing, but working on these scales will force you to figure out how to make it sound like jazz. Right? So now let's uh, add some more stuff to this. I'm going to do this. Right? So I'm finishing the... with that little uh, typical jazz phrase. And then here, that sounds great over the G7. I could also just ignore the G7. It's called harmonic generalization, right? But that sounds really good. Those notes really work over the G7 as well. So that's from that book, uh, David Baker, How to Play Bebop, right? So that's when we went, when I was in college, jazz college, we just joke about that, like, thank you, David Baker. Again, with this stuff, you have to be a little bit careful. So you have to be aware that these are extreme jazz cliches. But I'm one of those people who think that you should learn the cliches. Then you can decide, I've covered, I've talk, I always end up talking about this, but my point is that if you learn the cliches, you can choose not to play the cliches and play them if you want. Because if you play them at the right time, the right, right place, I think it can be awesome. I love jazz players who play the cliches, like George Benson. I mean, he, he kind of created some of those cliches, I guess, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I want to hear that. I'm, one, I'm not one of those jazz players who try to avoid cliches at any cost, but uh, that's the kind of decision you have to make for yourself. So 
if you think that it sounds a little bit too much the bebop book example number one then maybe just be a little bit careful with this stuff so arpeggios again i'm kind of assuming that you know how to play arpeggio <laughs> covered that a ton of tons of videos so I'm not gonna talk about it too much but let's start on the third that's it's kind of lame to start on the roots so let's start on the third and then you get this arpeggio instead so it's a minus seven flat five and I'm not thinking about that too much because minus seven flat five from D it's the same thing right as a B9 B flat nine so that it's a I guess you would call it the superimposed arpeggio D minus seven flat five over B flat I'm just thinking it's B flat nine. Here I'm gonna do this. So that's a half step up because that creates that B flat alter. B flat alter is the same thing as E leading on flat seven. So I can play, think of that as an E. If I play an E nine with a B flat on the bottom. It's a B flat alter. It's a sub five, right? You don't have to really know all this stuff. You just have to know that it works. It's the flat seven, the flat nine, the third, the sharp five, the flat seven. Then I do this. seven flat five over the G which creates a G alter situation you could do this over the same arpeggio a minus seven flat five over every chord but I'm gonna change for the C minor I'm gonna change it to a E flat major seven because again I'm starting on the third right instead of instead of instead of playing an arpeggio from the root starting from the third then I get those extensions and I don't play the actual tonic, which is more hip. E minus L flat 5 over the F and then again I do the half step up to create an altered sound. So the E flat minus L flat 5 creates an F altered arpeggio. I'll play it for you and see what it sounds like. arpeggios like that uh, and of course uh, you want to get away from when you learn to master it don't just play it like that you, wanna, you know come up with some variations like I just did there what else can we do when well, we can do this instead of playing we can play so by the way all this stuff I have written out for you for my patrons so I can't remember how many pages there was a whole bunch of pages with tabs so where were we? Sorry, I'm getting, uh, I digress. Oh yeah, you can do this. So that's another bebop cliche. So it's kind of building on that minus seven flat five arpeggio. Then I'll play a bop skip. Starting on the third. When you practice your bop scales, you should start on the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. I can't do all of it again because the video will take forever. But if you start on the third, you can connect the bop scale with this Donna Lee phrase. Or, so I'll do 
do that for you. scales i'm moving kind of fast here the bob scales that alone is that could be a video right just talk about bob scales so i'm moving kind of faster another phrase that we use that i've also covered in a previous video is the cry me a river lick because that phrase really outlines that chord so i'm starting on the 13th so i guess it's an f minor or triad I'm not thinking too much of all that stuff when I'm doing this. I am just know where it works. I learn where it works. I'm thinking licks. There's nothing wrong with that in my opinion. And then alter. So there I could be thinking E7 or B flat alternate. Remember, those are the same thing, just different bass notes. as well and to create a G altered I play so that's an A flat minor triad with an added note really gives you that altered sound Just a few more things before I leave you. When you play chords, you want to be aware of the top notes of the chord. If that note on top is part of the blues scale, it sounds really bluesy and kind of nice. were part of the blues scale then that sounds really kind of heavy but if I'm playing a extension like the C on B flat that note it sounds more elegant or it sounds more not elegant what is the word uh, more pretty as opposed to just something to be aware of that a lot of times you'll hear people comp in the blues, they, pl they like to emphasize that top note from the blues scale. So you can play a sharp 9 on the B flat. Now that you've learned all this, you practice all this stuff I'm giving you here. Bop scales, jazz, idiomatic licks, learn those melodies I showed you. So I didn't give you the melodies, no taps or anything. You should be able to pick up those melodies by ear 
they're not hard. If you, so, like this melody. <laughs> should be able to pick up those by ear so the Charlie Parker heads are a little bit trickier to figure out by ear but these uh, yeah not that hard so you learn those and you learn them in different keys don't get obsessed with all 12 keys but B flat F for sure and C and G right please let me know if you have some blues heads that you like that are simpler what, what are your favorites let me know in the comments I'd love to know I always try to learn like new ones. It's like collecting jazz blues heads. So then when you've learned all that, you try to combine it. You try to make it sound like swing and you make it sound good and good tone, good timing and good phrasing. So I'm not getting into that stuff in, in this video because it's, again, it's a too long, too much information, but you should apply all the stuff you already know. If you know some jazz licks, to this try to combine everything and eventually you will start to be able to play jazz blues without having to think too much also really really recommend transcribing solos don't pick super difficult solos pick the easy ones count basie is key when it comes to this stuff just the time feel of that big band and simple mel melodies and shout choruses super good to play along with us just Take any Count Basie record and play along with it. That's all the stuff I have for you in this week's lesson. I hope you find some of this information useful. Again, PDFs on my Patreon page. And uh, yeah, let me know if this was helpful. And uh, I shall see you next time.